This is CBC Here and Now. Service NL halts the draw. We'll tell you what's next in this card drama. Legal aid reorganization closing one office to open another. We are facing great pressure on our resources at the moment. Teenage wrestlers pin down some hardware at the Indigenous Games. I'm tracking showers and thunderstorms right now, and that'll be the case again for Friday into the weekend as an unsettled pattern sets up. The details are coming up. Well, people went to chase the ace expecting drama, but no one saw this coming. The discovery of duplicate numbers on some tickets forced the abrupt cancellation of last night's big draw in the ghouls. So what happens to all those tickets and all that money? Here now, Zach Gowdy is following this story for us once again, and he's joining us now live. So Zach, what is the latest? Well, right now, ticket holders don't have much more information than they left here with last night. The best we can tell you is that what happens next is up to the provincial government. It was lottery auditors from Service NL who forced the organizers to abruptly postpone last night's draw after multiple reports emerged of tickets that contained duplicate numbers. Now, Service NL says it is conducting an investigation into the integrity of the draw and that ticket holders should hang on to those tickets until they hear more. The incident certainly made for some dramatic moments here at St. Kevin's last night. Uh, when the first reports emerged of misprinted tickets, organizers assured the crowd that the area was limited to four tickets, all of which had been purchased by a single player. But then another player contacted CBC with photos of their own tickets, which also showed duplicate numbers. Finally, with less than an hour to go before game time, organizers came on the PA system to make this announcement to the shocked crowd. We are, we are asking you guys, hang on to your tickets. We will be uh, having the draw, um, we're not sure when, but hopefully within the next day or two. We so it's not really tonight. Not sure. from disappointment to outright anger, especially among those who came from out of town for last night's draw. I'm kind of shocked to, to see here that it got cancelled for tonight. And if the draw happens in a couple of days, I may not be here. So I'll have to find someone to come back with my tickets. Well, I'm not happy with it. I'm here since 11.30 this morning. And we bought our tickets. We waited around all day. So there's no reason why that the tickets can't be drawn on the air. Why should we have to come back? We shouldn't have to come back here. I mean, drive two hours to come back out here again. When and even if, when and even if they will be back out here for that postponed draw is an open question right now. The Chase the Ace organizers say they can't comment until Service NL completes its investigation. Meanwhile, the owner of the Print Shop Limited, the company that prints the tickets for Chase the Ace issued a short statement this afternoon. So Tony Burke, the owner of Print Shop Limited says, we are disappointed at the inconvenience that has resulted from this fundraising event. We hope that the phenomenal sense of community that the event has created continues to preside. We are working with Service NL to confirm that all conditions of the lottery license are being met and stand by our quality procedures. Being part of this event is a privilege and we will correct and improve any issues that are found. And that is Tony Burke, owner of Print Shop Limited, saying that they will uh, fix the problem but not offering any explanation or apology. Meanwhile, I can tell you from speaking with Chase the Ace organizers off the record that this is a terrible position they find themselves in today. Uh, again, these are volunteers steering what has become a very big ship. It was a tough job when it was smooth sailing, and now they have a real crisis on their hands. So for ticket holders, hang on to those tickets and stay with CBC for the latest on this story. Now I'm going to bring in my colleague Megan McKay for some context on how Chase the Ace lotteries work. Uh, Megan, you managed to find a person with experience running not just a Chase the Ace, but a printing business as well. Yes, exactly. I spoke with uh, Tom Badcock, who's been running the hub for the past 25 years. And, you know, he says the challenge with these things is that the organizers have no idea how far they'll go. You know, the ace could go early or it could go later like this. And you're looking at almost a million dollars and just as many tickets in a short period of time. 
So today, talking to Tom Badcock at the Hub, he had a lot to say. These printing machines are pretty much nonstop here. They didn't print the tickets in question, but Tom Badcock's well-versed on the subject, and he says he's not surprised there are mistakes with the Goulds Chase the Ace tickets. Because the number of tickets are being printed, of course, uh, by the equipment that's being used, there's going to be duplicates. Uh, you simply can't print a million tickets uh, and be assured uh, in that period of time that you won't have duplicates. And that's what happens. So. Why can't you? Well, it's because of the system. Whether it's the system behind me that's being used or the computer system or whatever, uh, as soon as you use a computer or some kind of a mechanical means, then you're going to get repeats. So he says that's why they and other printers check the number on every single ticket. But that's impossible with a million tickets going out as quickly as they have been at St. Kevin's. And while we don't know how exactly Service NL is investigating or what the organizers will do, Badcock knows what he'd do. First of all, I have to look at every single stub, every ticket that was sold. See if there's any duplicates, identify the numbers. Put it out there that we visited the, uh, the um, duplicate numbers, get the people to come in that have those numbers, give them new tickets or cash, and then once you are assured that there's no duplicates, make a draw. And that's not even all. Badcock says it's so easy to fake one of these tickets that the only way to verify them is to take the original in and check the perforation against the one that it was ripped off of in the first place. To physically compare the two to see if they match. Exactly. Just think about the time involved in that. Well, let's yeah. hope it doesn't come to that. And I also spoke with the folks over at the Atlantic Lottery Corporation. I mean, this is their business running lotteries. And they have all kinds of security measures in place on each ticket, plus a whole team of auditors and all these resources and so you know they said it's really hard for anyone especially volunteers like this Back. it's the work of a, a major company to do that kind of work so uh, again Megan thanks for that story exactly thank you uh, now as bizarre as last night's incident was believe it or not this is not the first time that duplicate numbers have become an issue at chase the ace just take a look at this we're going to show you footage firstly from the winning draw from the Chase the Ace in Happy Valley Goose Bay, a one that supported the SPCA in 2016. Just weeks before the Ace was successfully drawn, organizers found themselves drawing one number that had two winning tickets. In that case, both players got a chance at the Ace and both got a consolation prize. A similar story in Sydney, Nova Scotia last year. Two people had the same number there when the jackpot was 1.1 million, but neither was able to pick the Ace and the jackpot climbed to almost 3 million before it was eventually claimed. Uh, so folks, this is a story that has taken many twists and turns and there are still more to come. It is the case when developments could happen anytime. So please stay with CBC, especially on our website and our social media platforms. Whenever we know more, so will you. Reporting live in the Goulds, I'm Zach Gowdy for Here and Now. Well, now in other news, CBC News has learned that the Legal Aid Commission is closing an office in St. John's. The commission says there will be no layoffs, but a reorganization that will make legal aid more efficient. Here now is Jen White's been looking uh, and working on this exclusive story for us, and she's joining us now. So, Jen, what office is closing? Well, Debbie, the Family and Child Office in St. John's was brought in almost 10 years ago to give what the Commission calls an enhanced service to a vulnerable population, families dealing with child protection issues. Now, they received supports from a lawyer, a paralegal, and a social worker, and that group would help the clients further understand the legal process. Now, the head of the province's Legal Aid Commission says this will change, this change will have an impact. Where you had three people assisting before you've got one. It's going to take a little longer. They may be a little less comfortable. Um, uh, but in the end, I think they're still going to get the outcome that they should get. Um, I'd like to give them better, but economic times are economic times. We have to make do with what we have. And what we have is getting stretched further and further every month. Now, Summers says lawyers have been complaining that they're overworked. Caseloads has, have actually gone up by 12%, so they felt they had to do something. Summers says the family and child office staff have had a lot of success with its cases over the years, and the employees are not happy about this change. He says it was a tough decision that was not made lightly. 
we didn't want to do it. We've made submissions to, you know, anybody who would listen that, you know, we here's what we're going to have to do if we don't get more resources. But we understand the government hasn't got more resources. <laughs> it's everybody's tight and we were quite fortunate not to have our budget cut last year. Um, so it's, it's tough for everybody. Well, Summers says the Family and Child Office will be closing around July 31st, but two other similar offices in the province will remain open. And he says the commission will open a third general office in St. John's. Well, Summers says legal aid doesn't want to make this change, but ultimately it comes down to dollars and cents. Carolyn. Thanks, Jen. That's here and now's Jen White reporting live. Well, the president of the company that's taking over the mine in Wabush says he's confident there are enough iron ore resources, reserves to reopen it. Competing bidder Alderon claimed the Scully mine was only good for dumping tailings, but Matt Leighton of Tecora Resources says his company's analysis reached a different conclusion. The Michigan-based Tecora has signed a five-year deal to support Apply the international trading company Cargill with iron ore. Leighton says that endorsement is important. Put it this way, there are reserves there, and uh, we would not, would not have done this deal and put this capital at risk if that was not the case. And the proof is in the pudding, so to speak, with the five-year offtake that we have from a very sophisticated, successful company who happens to be the largest trader of iron ore globally. Now, the mine in Wabush closed in 2014 and went into creditor protection. Leighton in says work to secure all the financing will begin immediately. Production is expected to begin this time next year with 300 people working directly for the mine. There's about to be a lot of hustle and bustle in Cartwright. Within the next few days, the first shipment of seven 200-ton transformers will arrive. An area of the town dock has been fenced off and a large crane is in place. The transformers will be loaded onto trucks which will carry them to Muskrat Falls. Extra RCMP officers have also been brought in to ensure the transformers are moved safely. Last year, the town of Cartwright voted to block the transformers if they were transported through the town. The delivery was postponed partly due to that as well as large protests at the Muskrat Falls site. A judge has overturned a provincial minister's decision regarding a proposed salmon farming project in Placentia Bay. In July 2016, then Environment Minister Perry Trimper exempted the Grieg salmon farming proposal from further environmental assessment. But today, Justice Gillian Butler wrote that the minister lacked the jurisdiction to release the project. And she's now ordered that the project undergo a full environmental impact study. The province was also also ordered to pay the Atlantic Salmon Federation's court costs. Grieg's plan included a new $75 million state-of-the-art facility that would produce 7 million fish annually that would more than double the province's annual production of farmed salmon. Bulk buying, that's what provincial health authorities will soon be doing. Currently, the four regional health boards and the Center for Health Information buy their goods and services separately. But the province plans to change that practice, and it says the result will save the health care system millions. There will be some cost savings in the, the short and medium term, and you're looking at around $13 million, we estimate, on a $400 million budget. But the, the two longer term benefits are you're going to see better value for the dollar uh, that you spend because we can leverage the entire province's needs for dressing supplies or printer cartridges. A prominent businessman in Gander has gone to court to stop road work near his front door. Harry Steele wants a new highway turnoff moved away from his residence. The project will add a new turning lane from the Trans-Canada Highway into Gander. It's meant to improve safety at a dangerous intersection, one that's had multiple accidents, including a fatal one that killed an eight-year-old boy almost a decade ago. But Steele says the new road brings traffic right to his driveway, and in a court filing says he's worried about car lights shining into his windows. Steele's petition for a stop work order is due in court next week. 
The two candidates for mayor in Fort McMurray are weighing in on a Newfoundland Supreme Court ruling to banish Gordon Bishop from this province for a year. Now, the 33-year-old was found guilty of dragging a police officer with a car while trying to escape after a break and enter at a St. John's pub. He has a 27-page criminal record. Bishop's father says his son will likely spend his exile in Fort McMurray with his mother, but that's not sitting well with the mayoral candidates. Here's what one of them said. You know, at a, at a gut level, it's just kind of a slap in the face to a community that has been through a, a lot in the last uh, couple of years. You know, a significant economic turndown, uh, the fire. Um, it's been a struggle, and, and I'm sure even Mr. Bishop didn't mean it that way, but you can't help but take it as just a slap in the face, just a, just another uh, negative message that hey, uh, this is where uh, this is where a convicted criminal would, could go when they, you know when they're not welcome in Newfoundland. Um, it's it's just frustrating. We're we're a little sensitive to to uh, our uh, totally bogus reputation as being a, a, a place with a high crime rate. You know, a lot of crime. This is, this is a very safe community. People are raising their families here and it's it's just very frustrating that to have you know this this situation piled on top of what we're already dealing with. We're just not going to be opening our, our arms to, uh, to having this fellow show up here. The implication is that hey, it's okay to release this guy now on his time served because he's not going to stay in Newfoundland. We're not going to have to worry about him doing more bad things, uh, stealing, breaking and entering, and injuring uh, police officers because he's not going to be in Newfoundland. Um, the only implication anybody can draw from that is that, you know, the idea is we'll, we'll transfer our problem uh, from Newfoundland to somewhere else, to anywhere else where where this fellow ends up. And, and that's, that, is, an, is just something that drives a wedge between jurisdictions. You'll get a chance this weekend to watch the Newfoundland film Touch, which has won international awards. We'll have all the details in about three minutes. And how's this for too close for comfort? This water bomber flew pretty darn close to uh, tow truck driver Rob Squires in St. John's today. Wow, <laughs> Squires was parked on the highway near Patty's Pond when the plane came in for a landing. That would shake you up <laughs> for sure. Can you imagine the noise? <laughs> oh, it would be loud. <laughs>
Another stellar day. Beautiful. Yeah. Now, uh, before we get to the weather, I mean, it has been great weather for whale watching, which brings us to this. Uh, this family really did hit the jackpot uh, when they were out watching for whales. Wow. Orcas, yes. Uh, they swam around Sean Keats uh, and his wife and his two children on Monday morning uh, near Salvage. Yes, Keats says when they spotted the killer whales during their two-hour ride, they were just over the moon. Oh, I would be too. I've never <laughs> seen them uh, in in person. Keats mm -hmm. believes there were two pods, one with six whales and the other with eight. Aren't wow. they magnificent? I mean, we've seen them in this neck of the woods, but yeah. that close proximity uh, yeah. just fantastic pictures. I guess it's the capelin. Would it be the capelin that they're coming in uh, after? I'm assuming that, uh, yeah, the whales come in with the capelin, no matter if they're uh, big humpbacks. Or they're or... chasing the big uh, cod that come in after the capelin. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's right. Debbie I'm Cooper. I'm just guessing. Yep. <laughs> Uh, okay, so yeah, another beautiful day for whale watching today, though we are watching some active weather right now in central Newfoundland in the form of some showers and thunderstorms. Look at your highs today, 29, the hot spot in Newfoundland and Labrador in terms of the highs and the temperature. You can see, though, temperatures have really cooled off. Gander's back down to 20. Badger has recovered a little bit, uh, 24 there. Bonavista at 27, but we have been seeing some temperature drops as those showers and thunderstorms have been rolling through. Almost soupy at times in terms of what that air mass feels like in central Newfoundland today, in that uncomfortable to almost oppressive feel when you talk about the dew point. 18, 19, 20, that's starting to get like, you know, Florida, right, basically. So it has been feeling quite humid out there. Current humid X is generally near 30 from uh, Grand Falls, Windsor to St. John's. And again, that's what has uh, all that moisture in the air. That's had things bubbling up quite nicely as this cold front has been rolling through central Newfoundland with some active weather in the form of showers and thunderstorms. We've had some scattered showers in through southeastern Labrador uh, for today as well, but most of the action here has been certainly across the island. And you can see with the latest radar loop that's been rolling through Gander, and that is now heading out towards the, the uh, Bonavista Bay area. And these cells are all very active. Heavy downpours, localized hail possible, and yeah, obviously frequent lightning as we saw with the lightning detection sparking up there with the loop. You can see a gander again into some heavier rains right now and another cell that's just fired up north of Eastport here. This is all working to the north will likely clip the Bonavista Peninsula, but it will not move into the metro region. It looks like that will sail to the north of, uh, of St. John's in the metro area for tonight. For metro and for the southeast, it's a scattered risk of a shower tomorrow morning is that cold front weakens and moves through the area. But that's about it. A couple of spotty showers, maybe a little bit of drizzle early on. Everywhere else across the island is pretty quiet to start the day tomorrow. 12 to 15 degrees and a bit of a fresher air mass to start the day. Not quite as humid in central parts of Newfoundland. As you see, the temps are down to 12. Showers on the go in through western parts of Newfoundland and the north. As we roll throughout the day, the winds shift back to south. So a return of the humidity into the afternoon tomorrow. And with that return of the humidity, another risk of showers and thunderstorms starting to fire up. Mainly as far east is Grand Falls, Windsor, the Cornerbrook region, the west coast. Uh, it's again showers rolling from west to east through Labrador tomorrow. On the Avalon, I think we're looking at some sunny breaks through the day and then not ruling out a shower or thunderstorm into the evening hours. So keep that in mind. I think there is a slight isolated risk of a shower tomorrow afternoon, but the best chance of seeing precipitation tomorrow will be early in the morning with that drizzle and scattered shower activity. And then again in the evening with a bit of a not half bad kind of a day in between at 22 degrees. The clouds will be a little more dominant along the south coast tomorrow. That's where we're going to find some fog patches as well. Winds are going to become south southeast. That will hurt the temperature obviously along the southern shore and into metro at just 22. Get away from that southeast wind. We are talking once again 25 to 26 through central tomorrow. Cornerbrook in the west coast port to port into that thunderstorm risk uh, pretty much from uh, tomorrow mid morning through the midday and then that shower risk will then uh, push eastward into central. And there's that uh, slight thunderstorm risk in Happy Valley Goose Bay tomorrow as well. Put that icon out on there. You can see the east northeasterlies not so nice along that north coast of Labrador. More of that for the weekend and we will talk about that weekend in full detail in just a few minutes. Debbie.
Thanks, Ryan. The short Newfoundland film Touch has been racking up awards at international film festivals, and this weekend you can see it for yourself on CBC TV. I know we haven't talked for a while, but uh, I need you. I, I got offered a job. It might lead to a full time. Kristen Pellerin stars in the 12 minute film about a struggling single mom in a desperate situation. And Written and directed by Noel Harris, Touch is one of nine films being aired during the CBC okay. program short Rent film Face Off this Saturday night at 8.30 Newfoundland time. Wow. Good luck with that film. It Definitely. has been doing so well. We caught up with Kristen Oh, some months back, she was in Italy mm, picking up yeah. an award. So it was yeah. great. Lots Looked of like tough times. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, as uh, the Chase the Ace drama unfolds, uh, thousands are holding their breath, waiting to see what will happen next. Mm -hmm. And it's all been fodder for people online who aren't holding back with their thoughts or their jokes. <laughs> Here and now is Jeremy Eaton, of course, had to go <laughs> online where people are having a field day. Have a look. While the province and Chase the Ace organizers play a little 52-card pickup with where to go next, people on social media wasted no time poking fun at the fundraiser. Obama's inauguration, Trump's inauguration, the ghouls, Chase the Ace. Meanwhile, in the ghouls after Chase the Ace is postponed, Ryan McClellan went the fast and the furious route when it came to his meme. Or this one from the Newfoundland Turnup. Just bought my ticket off some young fella behind Coleman's. Wish me luck, gang. Jamie Churchill went the classic route. The ghouls chased the ace. I didn't print the goddamn duplicates. This hour has 22 minutes. Funny man Mark Critch weighs in. Everyone leaves Chase the Ace disappointed tonight, as opposed to every other Chase the Ace when 99.9% .9 of the people walk away disappointed. Photoshop Lee Lee Stewart went the Simpsons route. And another one from Photoshop Lee. At the Last Supper, Jesus was betrayed by the Ace of Spades. Alex E. Wells on Twitter wrote, Go to the ghouls, they said. It rules, they said. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Uh, you might as well laugh Absolutely. because some people are probably crying. Uh, but anyway, that's a bit of fun for us. Yeah. Newfoundland and Labrador's wrestling team scored big last night at the North American Indigenous Games. In about three minutes, we'll introduce you to the team.
Well, there's a happy bunch of athletes from this province in Toronto today. They're members of the provincial wrestling team competing at the North American Indigenous Games. Yes, and yesterday, three of the team members from Sheshashi won medals. And we've reached the athletes in Toronto along with their coach, Dustin Sylvie. So, uh, Dustin, how's everyone feeling? Uh, pretty good. We're all pretty happy. A little tired, a little sore, but um, we're at Canada's Wonderland now, so I think everybody's pretty happy. Well, I was going to say, you're, you're not at an arena. You are at Canada's Wonderland, and we understand there's a great story about how you all ended up there. Um, yeah, actually, they have an athlete's lounge set up uh, at York Campus where the events, our wrestling event took place. And I took a couple of the athletes there one night, and we did a dance competition and a plank competition. We had a good time, and then... So we took them all again the next night and one of the volunteers came up to me and mentioned like how well behaved my team was and how respectful they were and I said oh yeah and they said you know you're the only coach that's come to the athletes village and I just yeah okay I don't know they're good kids and they listen and we're wrestlers and it's about discipline right so anyways when we left the next day we competed we won our bronze medals and we were all feeling pretty good and then as we were packing up one of the volunteers tapped me on the shoulder and it was the woman I'd been speaking to and she said you know, can we talk to you for a second? I thought, oh man, would one of my kids steal something? What happened? You know, I'd imagine my brain goes bad. I don't know, maybe that's a bad thing. But, um, and then uh, she said, you know, I was really impressed by, you know, how well behaved your kids were and how they, you know, really listened to you and they really respected you and they respected everybody else in the lounge. And we thought, you know, what could we do for them? And an anonymous donor actually donated $500 um, for us to come to Canada's Wonderland in Niagara Falls. Wow. So that's why we're here now because of the donation. That's fantastic. <laughs> that must have been a, a bit of a surprise for you. Yeah, it was huge. Like one of the girls on the team almost started crying and we took a picture. <laughs> and it was really cool. Like, you know, it was a really cool gesture. And it's good to see that people notice, you know, that this team, because they have been really good. And, you know, I am a little hard on them and they know that. But at the same time, I think they realize why now when stuff like that happens. Well, can we meet some of them? Can you introduce us uh, to the team? Uh, yeah, for sure. I'll go around each of them and we'll, we'll start with Kira here on the left. Uh, hi, my name is Kira Drew. I'm from Con River and I am 17. Hello, my name is Josh Dyke and I'm from Shishishi. Hi, my name is Zoe McDonald. I'm from Con River and I'm 16. Hi, my name is Marcus Sargon. I'm from Shishishi and I'm from 15. I'm 15. Hello, my name is Aaron Fadel. I'm from Shashishi and I am 17. Hi, my name is Elena Wheeler. I'm 16 and I'm from Port of Port. Hi, my name is Benjamin Gregoire and I'm from Shashishi and I'm 15 years old. That's the whole team. Wow. So, who won the medals? Um, the medal winners were Josh Dyke uh, from Shashishi, uh, Marcus Organ from Shashishi, and Aaron Pater from Shashishi. And, you know, like, we're talking a little about the bronze, but everybody wrestled really well. Like, Kira had one of her best matches. Um, Ben placed fourth, and he was in a weight class six kilos bigger than he is. So it was, you know, we always talk about medals, but that fourth place is an important place too, and he did great. That's fantastic. Uh, Dustin, I wonder, is there any uh, one of the team members there who would like to say what it was like competing in their matches, how tough it was? I'm sure Josh would be up for that. Uh, one sec, I'll put him back on. Yeah, it was pretty tough. Um, this guy from Saskatchewan, he was... Yeah, pretty tough, and um, at that match, he just had a bit of a brain fart. <laughs> yeah, he, just, he just, you know, he was doing it, and he, we had a game plan, and he thought he saw something was there, and it wasn't, and the guy capitalized on it, and that's what happens in wrestling sometimes. You think you see something, but it turns out, you know what, it's not there, and you lose, but that's okay. We come back, and we've got Canada game, games coming up in 10 days, and four of these athletes are going there, so we're doing great. Can maybe they tell us a little bit about what it felt like for them to to win those medals? Um, I think, yeah, I think they were pretty happy. And they, you know, when they were on the podium, they were all nervous. It was actually kind of cute. They looked like a bunch of five-year-olds and they had to get up on the stage in front of everybody. It was, uh, it was pretty cool and they didn't know what to do and they got lost on the stage. And yeah, I think they were pretty excited and, you know, they got their medals, they went home, they're all hung up. Everybody's pretty, you know, and it was, you know, it's been a hard few days we got here early and we trained at six nations just outside of Brand um just outside of toronto and we were working hard and we worked them into the ground you know no one was walking right after two days of training and we went in there and we showed that newfoundland Labrador isn't a team to just look at as a buy you know we actually are here we're here to compete and we're doing great 
You absolutely are doing great. I'm just wondering, Dustin, uh, you or any of the team members there, can you speak to how much training you had to do before you got here? I had to sacrifice a lot of things. I really liked food, and then I had to eat, go on a really strict diet. And um, I had to run almost every day, which is a big lifestyle change for me. That was a big one. We had like we had a lot of weight cutting going on with the team to get them down some weight classes. Like Zoe, who just spoke, she lost 10 kilos in six months of training hard, dedication, eating right, well, and running. And then, you know, two two to three practices a week of two hours. And then when we got out here, like I said, we did eight hours in two days. So it's been hard on them. I think they're pretty bruised and beat up when they did the medical checks. These kids were covered in bruises. I think I think I got a few dodgy looks, to be honest with you. <laughs> so, coach, they must really love wrestling. They love this sport. Yeah, you have to. I think wrestling is one of those sports that if you don't love it, you're not going to succeed at it and you're not going to stay with it. It's it's hard. It's hard mentally. It's hard physically. It's, you know, in my opinion, it's one of the hardest sports in the world. And, you know, you got to be there. And these kids are all here. And, you know, and when they succeed in wrestling, you also see they succeed in school. They do better. They go further. And, you know, like Aaron now, he's finished school. And I introduced him to one of the coaches from Lakehead and Thunder Bay. And he's interested in maybe going to school there and wrestling with the team now. Like, it's one of those things that it teaches you that, you're going to end up in hard situations in life, and this is the way to get out of it. You fight through it, and you toughen up, and you'll succeed no matter what it is, and wrestling's there for you. Some great, great lessons there for sure. <laughs> Dustin, can you tell us what's next now? You mentioned the Canada Games. Uh, yeah, we've got four athletes going to the Canada Games. So Josh and Zoe and Aaron and Elena are all going to the Canada Games. So they'll go on the 31st of St. John's for a training camp, and then on the 5th of August, they'll head over to Winnipeg. Um, the rest of the team, we're hoping to hold an Eastern Indigenous Games next year is what I've been hearing rumors about. So that would be PEI, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland and Labrador. So that'd be great. That'd be another chance for these kids to show off their skills. So there's lots of opportunity. Um, a couple of them can come back to the Indigenous Games in 2020. And now that we have, you know, um, number 88 there that's talking about having the NAG Games every three years is like a commitment the Canadian government is going to make. I think this is a huge opportunity. And like I said, we showed up and that's awesome. It is awesome, and it's awesome that we could connect with you, uh, Dustin. Thanks so much. The best of luck moving forward, and thank everybody on the team for us. For sure. Thanks a lot. I'm sure they'll give you a wave goodbye here one sec. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Congratulations. Thanks a lot. We really appreciate this and really appreciate the interview. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. So that was uh, NL wrestling team coach Dustin Sylvie. He's helping us keep tabs on the medal count for this province. Yes, and Dustin tells us that so far Newfoundland and Labrador has three bronze medals. Uh, the medals we just talked about uh, that were won by the Shashashi athletes. Mm -hmm. uh, and track and field athletes have won two medals for a total of Five, and uh, we told you about those track medals earlier in the week. Uh, we spoke with uh, Jeremy Hallwell of Nain, so we'll be keeping our eye on that. Special attention is being paid to some people in Cornerbrook. We'll tell you why in just a few minutes.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Eight people from Corner Brook were given some special recognition today. They were awarded Canada 150 pins in honor of their volunteer work. Fewer than 1,000 Canadians are receiving the pin that's made from the copper of the roof of the House of Commons. The symbolic pin is part of the nation's birthday celebration. Here and Now's Colleen Connors was at the ceremony. Uh, it feels great, uh, you know, all volunteers kind of do their work for the same reason. They want to see people kind of breathe a little easier at the end of the day and um, sometimes it's a little confusing for volunteers to be awarded for their volunteer work because you do it because you want to do it, not um, for things like this, but it's events like this that really make you want to keep doing it and realize that people appreciate the work that you do, which is one of the best feelings ever because you do it because you want to, but knowing that the people appreciate it just makes it all worth it. We all know that Gary Brain touched many of our lives here in Cornwall because he started a teaching school here many, many, many years ago. This being Canada's 150th birthday, and there's so many ways to celebrate it, it's the most unexpected way for me to celebrate it. But having been in Cornwall for 50 years, I'm uh, very grateful for the support that would prompt such a nomination. Most of these students I have for years, and then, you know, whether they go on to a career or whether it's just the enjoyment of music, the reward comes from seeing that blossom. And what did you make of the other nominees here today? You and I think seven others received a pin. Oh, there was such a diverse, for so many different reasons. It, it might have had to do with uh, racial heritage or so many issues were included. That, uh, that's the wonderful thing about Canada. Hey, okay, that's a really good point. We're all recognized here today. So will you wear this pin proudly now? Oh, absolutely. I shall t explain to everybody that I'm wearing a part of the, the roof of the House of Parliament. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. Does something seem different to you? Yes, but I think it's just a mild spell, that's all. Man, what's the big bright thing in the sky back there? Oh, sure, I'd say it's one of the airplanes, old man. It's nice, but then I'd say Buddy forgot to turn his fog lights off, eh? Man, what's going on, man? Like, my skin's like leaking or something. I don't know, my buddy. I know there's one thing. I'm feeling pretty hard myself there in LA. I think this is that summer thing that all the mainlanders are always talking about. Wait, summer? What the frick is a summer, boy? A su summer? How do you pronounce NAL? Is it one of those words where he takes the M out of it? A summer? Like, how do you pronounce it? Summer, boy. Like, you, you know the weather that we always get? Total opposite thing of that. Oh, right on. Yes, dude, yes. you know what? Speaking of summer, we should go to the store and get summer or beer. Come on, we go. Come on, we go. Yes, boy. <laughs> I think they have heat stroke. Absolutely. <laughs> Just not His used skin is leaking. <laughs> uh, that, of course, courtesy of the guys at the outhouse. And a big shout out to them. And thanks uh, for, for doing that for us and letting us share it with you. Uh, summer. Summer? Uh, on the go uh, and uh, with summer and the heat that we've been seeing which yeah those guys are trying to wrap their heads around we'll also get the thunderstorms firing up and in fact right now we have a severe thunderstorm watch in effect for Gander, Bonavista North and just now into the Terra Nova region and this line is moving from west to east and with this the biggest threat is of course frequent lightning but heavy downpours as well, very torrential rains coming in with these heavier pockets that's now working uh, towards the Eastport area, pushing into the Terra Nova Park area. So again, if you are out and about, you are not going to want to get in, uh, be out caught in this uh, when the thunder roars head indoors. And especially when you see this coming in, uh, this would be a very, very heavy rainfall. And again, lots of lightning. Couldn't even uh, rule out a little bit of localized hail with this. And that's pushing east. What does it look like when it hits you? Well, this is the scene in Gambo moments ago and a big sh uh, thank you to Shane Mason when it's raining so hard it almost looks like snow it's raining hard and uh, thanks again to Shane for sharing that on my Facebook page uh, you can get in contact with me of course Facebook Twitter and on Instagram to send your pictures now that line of thunderstorms in association with this cold front 
and it's rolling eastward slowly but surely, but weakening as it moves over eastern Newfoundland for tomorrow morning. Still will bring the risk of a scattered shower, some drizzle in the mix as well. That fades into the afternoon and Friday afternoon looking pretty quiet for the most part across eastern Newfoundland, but we will see a late day risk of some showers and thunderstorms in the west, central, and even an evening risk of a storm in St. John's and the Avalon not ruling that out. Also a risk of a thunderstorm in Happy Valley Goose Bay tomorrow afternoon as those showers march from west to east across your region. Now for the weekend, this front, a uh, lot of disagreement in terms of the timing, but over the last couple of hours, it seems uh, we are seeing some, uh, a little more in agreement that that front will clear out through uh, Saturday morning. And so I think Saturday afternoon is dry on the Avalon, a slight risk, but it looks like it'll be further to our south. The best chance of uh, seeing some pop up showers, even a risk of a thunderstorm for Saturday afternoon will be in central parts of Newfoundland, an earlier day risk for the west as well, and quite unsettled in Labrador. This is a cold pool of air coming in. That's really going to make the atmosphere unstable. Temperatures are going to top out in the 10 to just 17 degree range across Labrador. A little cooler in those onshore winds along the west coast. And again, risk of some thunder boomers in central Saturday afternoon. I think St. John's, as I mentioned, the early day risk. Not so much into the afternoon. We'll, we'll see another risk into the evening. And then once again, another round comes in as these little troughs come in, almost like pinwheels on a bicycle wheel. And it, another one of these troughs comes in, makes things unsettled for Sunday afternoon with the daytime heating. Things bubble up and we will bring in yet another risk of some showers. Uh, not ruling out a thunderstorm there, but a little less risk. And I think St. John's a better chance for Sunday afternoon to get into one of those showers. So uh, just 12 degrees in through Labrador, as you saw on Sunday. Tally 10 race, the biggest takeaways, low humidity. It's the only thing anybody's asking me about. After a humid week, it does look like it will be low humidity and a tailwind, which is good. And those temps pretty comfortable with, again, shower chances more so into the afternoon. Monday, Tuesday, uh, temps starting to fall off next week. But looks like a bit of an onshore wind for the east, so we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, the exact opposite happening in Labrador as temps climb. It is time now to meet our athlete of the day. This is Quinn White from Manual CBS. Quinn is three years old and just started playing soccer this year with the CBC Timbits Mini Kicks team. CBS, CBS probably. Yeah, yes. it should be CBS, yes. I'm sure. Well, way to go, Quinn. You are today's young athlete of the day.
Welcome back to Here and Now. O.J. Simpson has been granted parole. A Nevada parole board decided today the former football star will be released from prison as early as October. He served nearly nine years for his involvement in a robbery. Kim Brunhuber reports. He strode into the hearing with his trademark strut. Fast forward through the preamble to the key question, one of the first questions you'd probably ask O.J. yourself. Yeah, Mr. Simpson, you've lived most of your life in the public spotlight. Yet you go into a hotel room in Las Vegas, bring along four other men with you. Two of them are armed and rob the two victims of property. What were you thinking? What indeed after all he'd been through? The 1994 murders of Nicole Simpson and Ron Goldman, the Bronco chase, the glove, the acquittal, we find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder. After all that, after getting off, to then spend almost 10 years in jail for what? A conspiracy to get his old memorabilia back at gunpoint. In 2013, he was granted parole for the lesser offenses, but now, finally, a chance in a couple of months to walk free. I've done my time. You know, I've done it as well and as respectfully as I think anybody can. Simpson, after all he's been accused of, clearly had little grasp of irony. I basically have spent a conflict-free life. Perhaps most powerful, the testimony of his friend, the robbery victim. If he called me tomorrow and said, Bruce, I'm getting out, will you pick me up? Juice, I'll be here tomorrow. I mean that, but... It was enough. All four board members agreed. My vote is to grant your parole effective when eligible. With that, as soon as October, Simpson will go back to rejoin his family in Florida. Thank you. I mean, I could easily stay in Nevada, but I don't think you guys want me here. <laughs> but the parole board was clear. If he slips up again, the state of Nevada will take him back. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. Another dead right whale has been spotted in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and that brings the number to eight since June. Wildlife pathologists hope a necropsy will determine the cause of death. Another right whale has been spotted entangled in fishing gear. The DFO is hoping it can eventually free the whale, but rescue operations are tricky. One man was killed last week while trying to cut ropes binding a whale. North Atlantic right whales are on the brink of extinction. Just over 500 remain in the wild. That's unbelievable. A daring landing on a freeway in New York. This pilot was forced to ground his Cessna after he ran into some mechanical difficulties threading the needle under an overpass uh, in the process. Wow, the pilot was the only person on board and he wasn't injured as the man in the car. He says he's still in shock over nearly getting into a fender bender with a plane.
Welcome back, everyone. Well, there's nothing like a surprise gift to mark a milestone birthday. And this one had a grown man in tears. Out of three! Alrighty. One, two, three! <laughs> oh, gee, Bill Porter from Winnipeg collapses to his knees and sobs with joy. After receiving this special present for his 60th birthday, the very same classic car that his father bought new in 1973. The Ford LTD sat in a garage for virtually the entire time since then. That is, until Bill's family and friends decided to polish up the vehicle as a surprise. Oh my goodness. And that was a surprise. <laughs> Great reaction. Well, Sunrise Stargazers were treated to a spectacular show in Whistler. Vibrant purples and greens painted the early morning sky. The aurora was filmed by photographer David McComb. He was up on the mountains before dawn so that all of us can have this stunning view. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. That is beautiful. Fantastic. Well, just enough time to show you the next three days quickly. Again, temps cooling off through the weekend, scattered shower chances, but some sunshine too, which is the good news. And, and speaking of sunshine, how about this sunset shot? A beautiful one. And this was taken in the Codroy Valley. Uh, Zandra, thank you very much. A fantastic shot yeah, there. And that, so many great picks coming in. They, that is stunning. I haven't been over that way. Uh, Got to get there. Yeah. With pictures like that, it's, yeah, it's road trip. <laughs> Absolutely. Have a great night. See you tomorrow. Good night. Good night.